My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here. And we're thrilled and delighted to welcome you to tonight's program, our second US-Canada Capital Poetry Exchange. Uh, the first was in 2017. I'll talk a little bit about it um, in a second. This one features poets Aisha, Sasha John, Brecken Hancock, and Aaron Moray. This program offers the library an opportunity to both celebrate contemporary poets uh, from our northern neighbor, as well as explore and deepen the literary relationship between our two countries. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to turn off your cell phones and any other electronic devices that you have that might interfere, interfere with this event. Uh, second, please note that this program is being recorded, and by participating, you give us permission for future use of the recording. Let me also tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the U.S. Poet Laureate, which is the only federally funded position for a literary artist in the country. And we put on 20 to 25 public programs like this one every year, mostly here at the library, but around D.C. and actually around the country. Uh, in fact, our current Poet Laureate, Tracy K. Smith, will conclude her wildly successful second term in the position with an event on April 15th. You can find out more about that event and all of our programs uh, on our website, www.lsc.gov poetry. We also have a sign-up sheet out in the foyer uh, if you want to get notifications of our events. Uh, and finally, last bit of housekeeping, uh, we have a little event survey that we've laid out uh, on the seats. Uh, I'll remind you of it at the end of the program, but we hope you fill them out. It, it's very helpful for us in terms of uh, what we do with our programming going forward. <clears throat> if you go to our website, you can find the webcast of our inaugural U.S.-Canada Capital Poetry Exchange from 2017, featuring poets Suzanne Buffum, Liz Howard, and David O'Meara. I want to thank the Canadian Embassy and in particular, Denise Winard, for continuing to support this program and help us celebrate Canadian poetry. Denise, where are you? I saw you before. Can you stand up? I would also like to give special thanks to Monty Reed, who I will introduce as the driving force behind both of these events. Reed is a celebrated poet of more than a dozen poetry collections, including most recently, Meditaciado Placente, did I pronounce that correctly? Oh. Published in 2016 by Brick Books. A three-time nominee for the Governor General's Award for Poetry and three-time winner of the Stephen G. Stephenson Award for Poetry, Reed is the managing editor of ARC Poetry Magazine and the festival director of Versefest. Ottawa's International Poetry Festival. Please join me in welcoming Monty Reed. Well, thank you. Thank you kindly, Rob. And it is a pleasure and, and an honor to be back here at the Library of Congress. Um, this is round two of the Canada Poetry, uh, Canada Ameri Canadian American Capital Poetry Exchange. And we need very much to thank our hosts here at the library, Rob and Anya, for hosting us again, putting up with us again, and also from us to the folks at the Canadian Embassy, Denis, Schwinard and his staff, who, whose support uh, has made this uh, possible and, in fact, expanded it uh, considerably over what, uh, what we had the last time around. And we're very grateful for that, so thank you. I am, as Rob said, the director of Versefest, which is Ottawa's international poetry festival. We're now in just approaching just about a decade of productions. Uh, the next festival runs in two weeks, and we've got uh, about 80 different poets from around the world, uh, most from Canada, of course, but 
quite a number of Americans and people from Ireland and Iceland and, oh my God, uh, Germany and Denmark and uh, other countries as well. We've done this regularly for, like I said, almost a decade. And uh, we're very pleased to be able to reach out and work in collaboration with other organizations. We've got a developing collaboration in Paris. We work with other festivals in Canada. And we, of course, work here with, uh, with the Library of Congress. And uh, we hope very much that you'll be able to join us uh, up in Ottawa next year with a bevy of uh, American poets. We have tonight uh, three important Canadian poets with us. Um, I'm going to introduce all of them to you right now and I'll ask them to stand up when I talk about them and uh, then they will read in that order and uh, we won't keep hopping up and down, it'll just be the poets that come up. The first poet that I want to tell you a little bit about is Brecken Hancock, who was uh, born in Saskatchewan, which is Western Canada, uh, but currently lives in Ottawa. And I'm introducing her first because she was really the reason that uh, sort of pushed me over the edge to, let's do this again. I heard her read a series of insomnia poems at a small reading in Ottawa last September. And they were wonderful, powerful, provocative. And I thought, hmm, we should do something with this. And so I asked if she would be interested in coming, and of course, she was. Uh, Brecken, as I said, is based in Ottawa. She has one book out, which I see is at the back, at the book table. It's called Broom Broom. And it's, uh, it explores an increasingly fraught uh, mother-daughter relationship. She also has a chapbook out called The Art of Plumbing, which uh, explores a somewhat fraught relationship with bathtubs. <laughs> Broom Broom won Ontario's Trillium Award in 2015, and Brecken has been slowly cobbling together a second manuscript based on uh, insomnia. Uh, while she's not looking after her, her two young sons. So please stand up, Brecken. Asia Sasha John is the second poet that you'll hear tonight. She was born in Montreal, lived for a number of years in Vancouver, currently lives in Toronto, so she's got Canada's major urban center is pretty much covered. Uh, she's a dancer and a choreographer and, her, and a poet, and her works have been performed in places like New York and Montreal and in other cities around the world. She's published three books of poetry, The Shining Materials, Thou, and I Have to Live. And I don't know if they're all there, but some of them are certainly at the back. They're all published by BookSug, is a well-known Canadian publisher. And the latter of those, I Have to Live, was a finalist for the Griffin Award, which is Canada's biggest poetry award. She's also our team leader when it comes to uh, Google Maps, <laughs> as, as we discovered as we tried to find our hotel last night. And our third poet is Erin Murray. Erin uh, and I go back about 40 years. I remember her, uh, her reading from her very first book, which came out in 1979. And, uh, she read in my small town in Alberta in 1980. She comes from Alberta, although she lives in Montreal now. And uh, she's been a steady producer of work ever since that time. So there's a remarkable number of books of her own poetry and increasingly of translations from a variety of languages. And her work has garnered international acclaim. She's won a Governor General's Award. She's won the A.M. Klein Award. She's been shortlisted for the Griffin Award, I don't know, what, three times, I think. Um, 
And I think, yeah, Planetary Noise is here. That's probably the book that's easily available here in the States. It's published by Wesleyan. She has three books coming out this spring. Uh, one, one of her own, uh, called The Elements, from Anansi, and two books of translation, uh, Galician and Ukrainian, I believe. So she is uh, an incredible and powerful uh, producer of poetry. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And Brecken, uh, it's yours. Thank you so much um, for that introduction, Monty. It's awesome to be here. Thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, I actually think this might be the first time I've ever read in the States. So it's the first for me, it's the first time I've been in Washington. And it's been just really wonderful to be here and to see the city for the first time. And I want to thank Monty for inviting me. And I want to thank Denny, who's been an amazing uh, host, and Rob and Anya, thank you so much. And um, I'm going to read from um, New Work, which is about insomnia, as Monty said. But I also just want to say that not only is it wonderful to be here, but it's wonderful to be here with Aisha and with Aaron, whose work I admire greatly both and it's been really great to share this time with you both, too. So thank you for being here with me. So this new work is called, um, the book is called Brave in Bed. And um, it's going to be a series of about four or five poetic essays. Um, and I'm going to read from kind of a smattering of pieces. So the epigraph to this particular section is from a from Patricia Lockwood. Where my hair is attached to my head, that's where I begin to be dead. I take my phone to bed, my husband on one side of me, my cell on the other. I turn toward the cell. The cadaver of a Texan murderer who died of lethal injection was encased and frozen in gelatin, then ground down on the axial plane, starting with a slice of scalp, one millimeter at a time. Photographs of his 1871 cryosections compile like leaves of a book, a stack of rectos that record the secret turf of nerves, stubs of axons and dendritic miles, atrial chambers, a bog of colon, fat, furls of brain and tendons, imprecisely milled, smeared across the surfaces. In a university lab in Denver, a mechanized rasp sanded him down in slivers, turning him to frozen, cadaveric dust. Each milling revealed an aerial view of viscera, a slab of anatomical features as stratum by stratum his head came open, an utter darkness was amputated into light. They shot photos of him, of the remainder of him, of it, of the rock hard and shiny top of a stump that had once housed an appetite and an imagination. I'm not moralizing. I love looking. These same layers of meat stack to make me. He was a murderer. 
to eliminate a witness during a burglary, he repeatedly stabbed a man and then shot the same man three times. He was convicted and sentenced in Texas where they put some kinds of criminals to sleep. He ordered cheeseburgers for his last meal and then refused to eat. And under pressure from the prison chaplain, he donated his body to science, but never knew that he'd be polished down, head to toe, a millimeter at a time, for me to look at. What am I looking at? A body is Adam's, mostly nothingness. I flip through his leaves. Where was he in here, in all these slices? You know the he I'm talking about. Sometimes I feel absolute, but not tonight. Lying in bed, I release Joseph Paul Jernigan, the 40 gigabytes of his data, and the blue light of my phone back to the nightstand. Dark tars the room. Our humidifier pitches white noise over the bed and accumulated slices of eyeball stare toward the ceiling. Skin chafes against a snag in the cotton comforter while I look into a suffocating stack of universe. It's the quality of the air. I can't feel it, but I can feel it touching me. Shadows against the plaster, but from here to there, air. Some of it's down my throat, packing me thick and wide and deep. We need better linens. Ikea's thread count is bullshit. Through earbuds, I hear Tara Brock's podcast. Relax right down to the root of the tongue. Notice how the mouth might fill with sensation. Tongue, gums, teeth, lips. To meditate is to apply attention to breath and body, and one moment of this activates a granular discomfort. Sense the throat filling the neck. I am Adams a surge of overlapping dots. Aware of the legs, the length and volume, so you're feeling from the inside out, right down to the feet, feeling the pressure, the warmth, the temperature, the aliveness inside the feet. What is the body if not a stump of wet dust awakened temporarily and inexplicably into life. Widening the attention so you can feel sensations throughout the body simultaneously. My skull disturbs a pillow. A micron slice of scalp crawls at the follicle. Every epidermal electron strikes the sheets. I wish someone would tell me what sleep is or how to achieve it. Every night I come to this bed like someone thirsty who's gone to the sink. I want to show up here and drink, ingest the lightless atoms of the room, knit the ingredients of darkness into my darkness, and quench what's tired in my cells, come away sated. But the ritual is more spell than transaction. There's no material here to slake the urgency of exhaustion. I've slid my spent body down into blackness, only to be stormed by the spiny debris of consciousness the mind's assault of the mind. Nerves snarl, the heart beats at the thorax from beneath. One by one, the hours dissolve, and I feel their loss as grief. I spend the night in the amplified consciousness of a fool, Google. 
Cells in the human body die and are replaced at varying rates. It takes six days to get a new cervix, two months to get a new trachea, 10 years to get a new skeleton. Neurons, the cells that make up the nervous system, spinal column and brain, don't die. But all the atoms in the human body, including those that constitute neurons, turn over. The top 30 layers of the epidermis are expired cells that slough off and become household dust. I touched my husband's back, there where he's already dead. All my life I've had trouble sleeping. When I was a kid, our house was infested with moths and at night they eclipsed our windows, pressing against the light source, moonlight. I was maybe three and it was maybe 3 a.m. and I woke up to a muffled something, to a change in the air. I got up to look out the window, but in the moving darkness put my palms against an agile curtain of wings. Those who sleep less than eight hours a night die sooner. Sleeping for five hours is better than eight. eight. Sleep less, live longer. Kids should sleep 13 hours a night to be happier. This amount of sleep is dangerous for your arteries. Most healthy adults need between eight and 10 hours. Since 2010, sleep range has widened for adults but stayed the same for children. Sleeping more than nine hours can have some pretty scary consequences. Sleep disorders have major consequences. Those who sleep less than four hours will suffer consequences. Cardiovascular disease, obesity, depression, diabetes, and even dementia. Those who sleep more than six hours die sooner. Regular oversleeping means a 44% increased risk of death. Getting too much or too little increases your perception of fatigue. You won't believe the amount of sleep that could kill you. I turned to Maria Kornikova's series of articles of sleep, uh, on sleep in the New Yorker. Here's what's supposed to happen when you fall asleep. Your body temperature falls, even as your feet and hands warm up. Circadian clocks throughout your body synchronize. Melatonin courses through your system. That tells your brain it's time to quiet down. Your blood pressure falls and your heart rate slows. Your breathing evens out. You drift off. Awake, alpha waves, drift, slow eye movement, relaxed wakefulness, rational waking cognition, slippage, hypnagogia, threshold consciousness, hypnic jerks, Theta waves, no eye movement, K complexes, slow sleep spindles, 13 hertz, fast spindles, 15 hertz, slow delta waves, parasomnias, confusional arousals, sleepwalking, night terrors, sleep sex, exploding head syndrome, rapid eye movement, paralysis, nightmare, dream, depressed frontal lobe function, sleep inertia, hypnopompic, hypnopompic speech, emotional cognition, Alpha waves wake. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Aisha. I'm gonna start by pouring some, whoa. I'm gonna start by, <laughs> by backing up. <laughs> um, and then I'll proceed uh, by pouring some libations for ancestors. In the Library of Congress. Ashe. <laughs> um, I'll begin by Holding my position. 
uh, reading a poem from my latest book, I Have to Live. I decided that I was a planet and I was a planet. I had to. I decided that I was a planet and I am. I want to love. I see old women who live. They know something. It's true I've suffered the delusion that I am unlamb-like, but oh my gosh, that's crazy. Though it doesn't matter where I sit and that I'm fucking crazy. God gave it to me. I have to live. It doesn't matter where I sit and that I'm fucking crunchy. I have to be fibrous so as not to be consumed. I have to fucking live. I can live in the world with the people. I can live in the world with the people if they understand that all a poet is is some bitch who thinks she's better and feels sort of bad about it, but not, not really that bad, more like feels bad for feeling bad at all. Also, I need a lot of money so I could have a lot of money. That's why I need it. I need a lot of money so I can have it because I need to have money. Honestly, since casting that spell, I've, I truly have more money. <laughs> Praise is, um, this is newer. Someone put a small square of black fabric on the dead possum laying on the curb south on Brock Street. The morning pre-bagel, a spoon of honey crowned in walnuts. My problem is permeability after performance. The place elegance argues grace. Imagine if white women wrote books cognizant of the fact that they are white women, that there is no woman. When I read the work of a white woman, I can tell she's white. The acupuncturist said my liver was gushing with rage. Day of rest and week. I can be sitting and read and think. I am not helping people understand me anymore. Cat versus lamb. Gold garden. Substrata. The sweet hard light of the sun. Some of us have been to hell. The ultimate yellow brick is gold. Blood red, small men's t-shirt, backwards. I am becoming my own favorite artist. I am not how I have been insatiable. I am at war with what is ravenous in me. Eating fast is like taking drugs. We need to work on the outrageousness of our imaginations. Sometimes the cat steps on my hair, bread, or something I have to cook. Discover the versatility of tempeh? No. He distinguished between the performance of free will and the freedom of surrender in a file I can't find. Okay, I just figured out what Jesus is a metaphor for. It has been my experience that organic dairy will not give me pimples, that the circle constitutes the witness and not a boundary. I put the circle inside me in the studio today, I put the circle upon me. Four raisins will last as long as a box if you eat the raisins as a prayer. Naturally, I would like to name something four raisins. He recommends mindful smoking, how eating might have nothing to do with suffering. Imagination amelioration, imagination repair, imagination injury. When the body says, I freaking told you, for which I must go to France. That's it. I need Bouteau training. The great upgrade. Neither afraid nor aggressive. Knowing the night inside. That my rage models have been male rappers. Rabia of Basra. One day she was seen running through the streets of Basra. Carrying a pot of fire in one hand and a bucket of water in the other. When asked what she was doing she said. I want to put out the fires of hell and burn down the rewards of paradise. They block the way to Allah. I do not want to worship 
from fear of punishment or for the promise of reward, but simply for the love of Allah. Virgo Pisces axis, light ever increasing, fellowship of the cave, Vancouver, Senegal, Grenada, unseen Obama pictures, what I like and love, cat chested, spring squared, immediate, close, proximal, here, the brim, the verge, versus the great giving up. I trouble the curtain. I dance my hands between the curtain. I trouble the curtain. A mouth, a spine, and a sex. Hashtag snake. Sasha John technique. The big titty club. Water for water. Juice for juice. Nobody reminds me more of my mother than me. I have known great love in something unusual and rare as recently as every time. The sad I feel is proportionate to the love I've known. I do not feel sad and I do not feel lonely. Not, dear God, who am me? The cat upchucked and re-ate her chicken treat. Just sort of essentially and stupidly so. I am not particularly romantic. The younger, the baby, the them friend, the lady. An infant and an angel. What would constitute outrageous actually? The occasion is not the cause. I walked along the water and I sang alongside it. To eat baked lays and be half an hour late. What actually is bread? I ate half of the lamb and the rest is rotting in a Tupperware container I won't open. Is it possible those were like dud Advils? Bleeding from my pussy, again. Retrogradation, hot and moist, too sweet stout. The cat's capacity to cuddle, all instructional, ever blooming. Antidepressant Octavia Butler, optimism bias, the planning fallacy, the cat and the Q-tip. The instrument is not the occasion. The occasion is not the cause. To be soft and also inaccessible. The psychedelicness of sobriety. The sky is white and gray. The flesh of a lamb is in my fridge. Three fillings for six eighty nine. One thing about Toronto, it's bright. The occasion is not the cause. Apparently there are people not hungry for everything all at once. Burrito under her fingernails. Our children's 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 children. Canadian apartheid. This country is sick, am I right? Cross community crying, a cry in, class picture and cry. Dreamt I had a belly button in between my breasts cloaked in labia. From course to fine, the most important thing to know felt. The koi fish and the cat. I want to be a Calypsonian. I did a drawing of the blood. She put a string around my loose tooth and shut the door to swallow whole and squeeze soft. The snakehood, the priestess, the goddess, the supplicant, God, that you were never born and will never die. From perceive to predict, I would like to thank love. I have to tell my truth with my throat or my eyes or my energy. No one can shut me up. No one can stop me. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I too would just like to start by thanking uh, Rob and Anya and Monty and my magnificent colleagues, Breck and, and Aisha. It's, uh, I'd like to go all over the country and many countries and just listen to these two. They're so great. They give me uh, a renewed feeling of, of courage and a renewed faith in poetry. So thank you two so much for your, for your work and for your presence. I'm going to read a um, couple of poems or a little bit from Mrs. Planetary noise, it's like a 40 year retrospective, even though I'm only 12. <laughs> um, something happened. <laughs> Anyways, um, it's published by Wesleyan University Press in the States, and I think uh, one, of, one of the reasons for that um, is, is that because I, I've, I've been working translating a lot of poetry written by 
people who are not Canadians and because of restrictions uh, and in funding for small Canadian publishers which struggle to survive, they're not allowed to publish foreigners. So I have to find, um, even though I wrote all the books, words in my translations, because if I didn't write them, I don't know who wrote them. <laughs> um, but so I have to find uh, places to publish and one of the places where I publish my translations is the United States. So I. Uh, there became to be a bit of interest in my own poetry as we ended up with this selected poems. So I kind of uh, feel like a trans-border poet, it's sort of fun. I'm going to start with two pieces from Planetary Noise from a book, the book that won actually the Governor General's Award in 1988, so 31 years ago. Um, some of the poems in that book, Furious it was called, um, I wrote little essays for, so I'll read a little essay for one of those, one of the poems then I'll read you the poem. What that surface is still haunts me. The people who move in the surface of the poem becoming signs, are they form or content? They are not the real content. And in my loneliness for days I am breathing brother air, my brothers outside throwing the football. The wall they are throwing it over is the huge gap between us. It is just air. I think of the people who go around carrying the scars on their arms that they have made for themselves. It is defiance of the real. It is saying you can defy reality by mutilating your skin, that surface. As if your own physical matter is the place where you can leak outside of the real. It is a refusal of desire. At which point do we not refuse memory too? The poet instead defies reality by writing it hard into the pages, building that surface content as a form wherein she makes her defiance visible. The real that women has never inhabited as whole beings, it has never been formed by our desire, Irigari says. I want to write these things like unfurled and dressy that can't be torn apart by anyone, anywhere, or in the university. I want the overall sound to be one of making sense, but I don't want the inside of the poem to make sense of anything. People who are making sense are just making me laugh is all. <laughs> this is the poem Unfurled and Dressy. Frontally speaking, I am facing up to my harbingers. I am wearing a small beam to stop from measuring the sky. I am approaching my debits with a voice left from the elections. A yelp, the start of a cry. Frontally speaking, I am leaning on the hugest boulder by the wayside in order to imprint the mountain on my ass, in order to jump into the abyss with my shoes named Kafka, in order to complete the fire escape of my marriage. Frontally speaking, I am no more important than the construction of a stadium in the place where they refuse to build housing for the poor. I have inside me no less sky than the sky. Frontally speaking, my sadness wears another seven beside your opportunity. It is unfurled and dressy. It is your voice which I am speaking over and over because I like to hear you inside my mouth where I can touch our futures with my tongue and throw down my names and embrace you and forget which one of us I am. Frontally speaking, frontally speaking. So that's, that's two poems from that book. And I thought I, I would read a little bit of a text from, uh, is this, well, I have two translations coming out this spring, but this is one of the more recent ones, Paraguay and Si, uh, Mar Paraguayo. It's a, a famous Brazilian book by a writer who was actually, I promised him I would translate his book, but he was murdered in 2010. And um, eventually in about 2014, I had a residency, so I had enough uh, time to work on the book. The book is written, a little bit hard to translate, because it's written in Portunal. Does anybody know who Portunal, what it Portunal is? Everybody? Okay, Portugal is a border language. It exists uh, between Uruguay and Brazil, and th in this instance, it exists between Argentina and, um, and Paraguay and Brazil. And basically, it's people whose, um, whose home language was historically, um, it, you know, it was historically Spanish, mixed sometimes with Quechua, and um, so sometimes with, with Guarani, in this case, the, one of the, the main uh, indigenous languages of, of uh, Paraguay. 
but they were ended up in the borders of Brazil, so they had to go to school in, in Portuguese. And so they started to speak this language that's a mixture of, of uh, Portuguese and Spanish. And it's kind of understandable in both. So I tried to translate this book into a mixture of, of French and English, which are the kind of portunal of where I come from, Montreal in my community, we call ourselves the Franco-Mixophones <laughs> because we're kind of Francophone, but we're mixed up. And uh, like me, I write in English and, and talk in French. But um, So this, this is what you end up with so that you can understand some of it if you don't speak French, but, and some of it is a bit funny. And uh, I love reading it because it really screws up my mouth. L languages are spoken in different parts of our mouth. So after I finish speaking something in French and I go into an English word, sometimes it's fun because I'm still in the French part of my mouth. So it sounds like I have a French accent. <laughs> anyway, I'll just read you this. La fatigue des métals, l'œuf de l'œil de scorpion, the lurking, the tacit meat made a yoke, Inter inheritance of our elders, what spent, the les years, Moite ville, moite vie, the scorched crossing, rivière ébulliante de cinquante winter, the dark face of exhausted blood, kidneys already failing, la pression artérielle, nettle and paprika, the cape or end point, the sea, le cap, la mer, the fact and the cape of good hope, those lost in the brambles, the fact, l'arc du sinistre, they pallid ones, dusk, our chambre, nos maisons, niamomiri, the humblest lamp, our bed, the amputated sex that still itches, and I choke it, the flaccid, le flux, the hollow of the hollow of the middle, it's all in half light. And there's worse, demain il faut que je me chante à nous et mes chansons, and maybe I will feel as complete as all the stations of the darkest hour. Aquidouane, Dorados, Puerto Soledad, cities of riviere and dust, of bones languid at exactly two in the afternoon, sieste et feu, it dumbfounds us febrile in an imponderable viscosity. It all goes sweaty and sucks, it all blanche creamy in the death shudder of innards éclaté plus the gut ache full of scorn and vomit. The tree does not move tout seul, the taste of sex on the tongue, la langue, le sex in multiple languages. I vous, almost like a deflowered rose. Death and sex don't talk, but how splendid sex feels. <laughs> the belly that lifts its hackles, resounding tremor of the skin touched par désir and coma. The air, all the air as it was, choked, a thirst that can't be slaked by water in the sudden fear, just as after un peu, le deur soleil could dry out les rues where rain only bordel et barre de porte, dead and void from this fatigue de personne et de no one. Aquidouane. How triste, how melancholic sont les soirs qui s'attardent, brûlant et encore mute. Notre maison des femmes, our house of women, on the main drag on the frontière, our bedrooms suffocant, sheet and sex and set punishing heat. All of it in ce temps-ci, right now, I can't forget. So it makes up a kind of destiny, a way of suffering less, that God gives us so only today can we recognize cette inclination we have to martyrdom and jubilation. De couteau et de blade. May thy great hand forever save us so the definitive crystal or its splendid shard doesn't plunge into our souls in the form of in the foam of blood and glass, the sea tinged ruby. Para piete, para. Those are Guarani words that mean into, into the Red Sea. So that's a little bit of, of Wilson, because I like it kind of when he haunts us a little bit. Um, this is this is from this. It's in this book, but it's from this book. It's a I've translated five books by the Galician poet Chuspato, Three of which were published in the UK. One of which was published in in uh, the USA by Omnidon in San Francisco. And um, I want I really wanted we translate poetry to bring work that people can't read otherwise into our own community. So I really wanted to bring this into my own community. And so I wrote this. It's a kind of a, a text a session of Chuspato. It's a kind of a literary biography and poetics, in a sense, but very poetic texts. For each one of her texts, I wrote one of my own, picking up on something in her, in her text. And then after the, I wrote all those texts, I wrote one extra page of my own text using random words on my desk. And that way, because there was one extra page of my words, it was a Canadian book. It counted as Canadian, and so it could be published by Book Thug, my, one of my publishers in Canada. So 
I'm going to read the the one from from the uh, that is excerpted. There's a section of translations in the back called Polyresonances of Planetary Noise. I'm just it's called the house which is not extension but dispositio itself. Inventio, dispositio, elocutio. So as to harness electrical impulses in the brain to communicate with one in a vegetative state, we ask her to imagine walking in the house for no or playing tennis for yes. And she answers our questions. Yes, Alexia is my father's name. Memoria pronunciatio. The head, chief member of the body. Consciousness as spatiality and motor call. After the accident, Alberta nestled in the glass prism, tubes and wires, her torso and head puffed, the machine breathing outside her body, a pallor pronounced and shiny, halo and plates, painkillers in liquid penetrative form, the whole sawn then sewn with skin through which her cortex bulges. Alberta, I whisper, I felt that big quick, it's me. There's no surface reaction, but deep in her body, a chemical knowledge shivers. Alberta, land of aspens and her father, the lard pale lunch bucket of her uncle, and the river valley and horses. Or organized blood. That lump in the leg looks like organized blood, the radiologist tells me. You should get an MRI. Oh, you bet I should, I said and did, and it was not organized blood. Converse with her silence. Condition, condition upgrade to hopelessly conscious. EEGs show enhanced motor activity, area activity following a request to play t imagine playing tennis. An activity in the parohippocampal gyrus, posterior parietal lobe, and lateral premotor cortex after a request to imagine walking in the house. Consciousness is awareness of language. Consciousness is language reversible and striated in the cells a thing removed from use and brought to its origin, the way forest intends house. Senses, it's now known, can be built on top of other senses. Touch neurons can act as sight when receiving impulses from infrared beams of light. Touch neurons use these beams of light to touch at distance, and the organism sees. Language is also a prosthetic beam of light. At a poetry reading, Extra senses bloom in the participants' skulls. An operation of words can touch using voice beams, enabling new sense capacities. Now, offer listeners three paired stimuli. Silence versus sound, unintelligible noises versus intelligible speech with low semantic ambiguity, and speech with low versus high ambiguity, poetry. Activation in the temporal lobe occurs in response to sound silence pairs and speech noise pairs. More widespread brain responses are obtained to ambiguous and unambiguous speech pairs. Activation too is detected in the interior frontal lobe in response to ambiguous speech in Broca's area and the area for the management of risk. The primary auditory cortex responds to a familiar voice calling, calling the listener's name. Higher order temporal areas activate as well. A name, a voice, a familiar voice, a poetry reading. Ambiguous speech and the voice of the poet equals widespread cortical activation. When awake, we can report that we are conscious. Poetry mechanism, I report, I am conscious. Alberta's forest, it took a long time to live in the ruined body its heterogeneous particles. Though Alberta today speaks but few vocables, words still touch her, beams of light. Imagine yourself, I say to her, walking through poetry, your new home. Thank you. Well, Aaron, since you just sat down, now you can come back up with your other two readers. If you don't mind sitting down, we'll have a little, a little moderate discussion. I do want to give you all time to uh, ask some questions, too. So come on up. Come on. Okay. Get the stairs or go straight away. Um, <laughs> so 
So because this uh, event is titled the U.S. Canada uh, Capital Poetry Exchange, I do want to talk about the relationship, literary and otherwise, between the two countries. But I think we should start with Canada. And just if you, the three of you could each talk about the traditions and communities you feel part of and give us a sense of what those traditions and communities look like. Tradition. What are our traditions? Mm. What are our traditions? The people I hang around with like poetry a lot. I don't know if that's a tradition, though. Um, I live in a community. I live in Montreal, so it's a French-speaking, uh, North America's largest French-speaking city, of course. And um, it's very culturally lively. Um, it's an amazing theater, amazing poetry, amazing writers, amazing newspaper to read, amazing uh, places to go. And um, I guess my, my community is, is a community of people who also translate, so that's usually people who uh, know one, two, or three other languages besides uh, French. And we just enjoy words and communicate uh, our pleasure in words in translating things. I translate into French, which is not my native language, with uh, corrections and help from uh, Daniel Canty, a friend who's also a poet and a writer and a filmmaker. I translate into the, uh, from Ukrainian into English with another colleague who speaks Ukrainian uh, um, much better than I do. You can say hi and bye. Um, and, and so on. So we're always getting together, having um, uh, conversations and things. I guess one of our big traditions is come over to my house and have borscht. <laughs> That's a, that's a sensitive topic, I think, for me. Um, I think that because of the internet, um, in terms of poetry, I'm also a dancer and a choreographer. So I'm, uh, I live like a, in, in two worlds. Um, I feel um, community and kinship with uh, Geography isn't the isn't that important. Like some of the people that I feel the most kinship with are American, are like in the Bay Area or New York. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. I think that when I was first trying to think about writing a book. <laughs> long before a first book ever materialized even, I really felt back then that I needed to pick a tradition. I also um, went to a university in Canada that has a master's in creative writing program. I was doing a PhD in English literature at the time, which I ended up dropping out of, but um, the m I took poetry classes, workshops with uh, f you know fellow students. And at the time, I was really, I guess, mentored and kind of felt obligated to pick between lyric and experimental or, you know, word, uh, word you know, language poetry versus um, the lyric I was <laughs> a big threat at some point. Um, and so those distinctions used to feel, I think, a lot more uh, potent for me than they do now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually identify a lot with uh, my friends who live in Ottawa. And we uh, write across different styles, I think, and have different publishers. And uh, in Ottawa too, like the, the, the festival that Monty runs, we have multiple languages uh, presented there, multiple forms, sound poetry, page poetry. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Canlit, <laughs> we've talked a little bit about this on our, our past couple of days, the three of us together, and that institution has become, like we, we have this thing in Canada called Canlit, and it's sort of like the institution of Canadian literature or something and I think all three of us have talked uh, together about feeling alienated from like that but um, 
when I'm, you know, at local events or when I'm talking to people, I don't feel that pressure. I don't feel the pressure of like that looming thing that I kind of feel like I need to get away from or disavow. And so it's, uh, it's yeah, it, it's difficult, I think, to be a poet with nationality. It's like, <laughs> I kind of would either like to blend in to an international community through mm -hmm. connection or just like shrink into a particular group of friends and like kind of leave the whole idea of nationality yeah. out the door. Yeah, well, why don't we talk a little bit about the relationship between the US and Canada. And I do wonder, since you brought up uh, credit bearing programs and we talked, uh, you talked a little bit, uh, Aaron, about um, the issues of publishing, um, what part uh, do publishers, prizes, festivals, and schools play in connecting or dividing poets from the US and Canada? What role do, what's again, prizes? Uh, publishers, prizes, festivals, and schools, for instance, you talked about the issue with your translations not being able to be published in Canada, and it's interesting that you're published by Wesley and, and a, a noteworthy American publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're and sort of uh, Paraguay, she's published by Nightboat Books in New mm -hmm. York, mm -hmm. so they're also unknown. Do you feel that there are more publishers, more American publishers, uh, highlighting Canadian poets in the last 10 or 20 years than there were in the start of your career? Um, well, there's, there, I think there's more poets uh, crossing borders, like crossing the border that are known in the States, more Canadian poets like Lisa Robertson. Um, I, I kind of, uh, even Nicole Brossard a bit, uh, writes in French, uh, but is widely translated. Um, if you, and there's been uh, bookstores too, because c the Canadian publishers, which are a lot smaller, I mean, a country is, you know, one tenth the population of, mm -hmm. of America, and we have a bigger physical space for things to get across mm -hmm. as well. Um, that uh, I, I think slowly our, our publishers have been finding better ways of finding distribution systems, and there's distribution systems now that, that cross the border that, um, I, I, it's probably partly with the internet too, with just the, the ease of, of buying and selling things across the border, until they put a 60% tariff on books, but we hope that won't happen. Um, <laughs> for, for us dumping Canadian poetry in the USA. However, um, the, you know what I mean is, is like from Ingram, for example, a large American distributor, they can order Canadian books published by Book Thug, published by Coach House, published by Anansi, so that you can go and you can find things in the bookstore. We were in Bridge Street Books the other day mm -hmm. here in DC and um, they had uh, three or four of my books. They had, th there was books by other Canadian poets, there was a book of yours. There's like, so that it's, uh, it is a little bit easier now for people to cross the borders, I think. Um, I just I, I just remembered, just to go back to your previous question, mm -hmm. <laughs> my mentor and editor, Dion Bran, um, who I went to, like, who I studied, um, she was the reason I went to the grad school that I went to. She lives in Toronto, and she's such a, like, a, a f like, a important figure for me that, um, like, she's, like, part of the landscape in a way, so I just, I, I, I have to mention her. Um, in terms of the the crossing. Um, my previous publisher, Book Thug, they publish a lot of American authors, mm -hmm. um, and I went to the Naropa Summer Writing Program mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. after my first book was published, so I met many American poets, and they recognize Book Thug, even though it's a Canadian publisher, because of the exchange. So I think there's um, things happening around certain presses as well as the fact that um, if people like things, they talk about it. That's what, like, so I think, and it's, we're, you know, uh, we're writing in English. Uh, like, there's, like, there are so many reasons for the exchange to be, um, like, easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot, of, a lot of people that I know, maybe, who are Canadian, have come to the States through creative writing programs. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe pursued, uh, like we talked about Iowa earlier today, like coming to important schools in the US to study if, if they're able. And that can be a way of, of 
cross pollinating. Mm -hmm. I think also, yeah, through presses. I'm thinking about things like AWP or ways that that um, you know publishers in particular and their and their and the writers find ways to all get together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and make connections that way. I think though that it's natural, well, I don't know, natural is not maybe the right word. It's, 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 it's a normal part of the process of becoming a writer in Canada to look to the States and to read a lot of, you know, I've read, we read a lot of American poetry. So I think it's not as, it's, you know, not unusual for us to have a pretty broad understanding of American poetry, and I'm not sure it happens the other way, but again, to Aaron's mm -hmm. point, we're a lot smaller, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I wonder, too, if you think about this cross-pollination, this exchange uh, of, of poems and poets across, this, across the U.S.-Canadian border, if that is um, in some way a parallel to the ways in which we connect culturally, or does it provide a kind of contrast? Does it provide a sort of best case scenario? Is it a direct challenge to the way we think of Canada and the US relating to each other culturally, historically, politically? I don't, I don't think it's kind of as big as that because we, oh yeah. I don't think it's quite as, as, as big as Canada and the USA. Like when we come here, we went to this marvelous event, as we were saying last night, um, and met some uh, poets from DC. And it was just really interesting having this. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a public event, so there was no public there. But we just each read poems to each other and got a little bit more familiar with what we did and what talked about what might be some of the driving forces in our own poetry. And so for me, it was like going to a new neighborhood mm -hmm. and seeing what, what, like what are the forces at work in your neighborhood? What are you fighting for? What are you fighting against? What matters, what matters in your neighborhood? And because so many uh, poets teach and uh, in this community like a lot of the uh, two of the poets at least we talked to last night teach high school which I think is so great because high school kids really need people who can actually teach poetry well and aren't afraid of it which poets are generally speaking not that afraid of poetry but um, but um, just to be able to talk about what they see for the future of these kids they're teaching to and what I don't know I just got the sense of getting to know a neighborhood, getting to know a group of people that have diverse concerns. I didn't really think of them as like, oh, these are like Americans, you know, members of that American species. But I thought of them as, <laughs> as these folks live in DC and they have, to, I mean, they have to deal with the fact that they live in the nation's capital. And, uh, but on the other hand, which is a set of complexities in itself, but other, on the other hand, they have their neighborhood, they have their people, they have uh, mm -hmm. different communities that they're trying to communicate between and through. I don't know, I just, so whenever I go to a place, I feel like I'm trying to learn something about a community. I mean, one thing that occurs to me is like, um, my, one of my mentors when I was in grad school, Lisa Robertson, um, in on the West Coast, so in Vancouver and like San Francisco and the Bay Area, there's a, there's an old tradition of exchange, um, what do you call it, the, the KS, what, did, what do you call that? The KSW? Cookie School Writing? Yeah, exactly. That existed and then didn't exactly. exist, but still existed. And so there was a symposium. Yeah, and so <coughs> as I was like coming up, I was at symposiums with um, California-based poets. Um, per, like as a black woman, like in terms of like looking at other black writers um, in the US, um, yeah, culturally, I mean, th this is what I was gonna say. Culturally, I mean, you know, U.S. imperialism is a thing, so our c culture, like, is highly influenced by yours. Like, like that's kind of, like, it's, I think that's why we're a little stunned at the question, because it's, like, almost so, uh, it's, it's such a ground for our, like, of our cultural reality to be informed by U.S. TV, movie, like, it's, it's really, it's, you know, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if, uh, yeah. I just but want to add one thing, though, just into that. That's in English. Because in, that's true. in French, we yeah. watch, uh, there's great TV made mm -hmm. in Quebec. Um, I don't watch TV, but I know there is because people talk about it and, and the, 
that's where the actors live in my building. And, and, but that um, I find we get to know the US poets. We don't sort of point ourselves so much, even if they're English speaking in Quebec, to uh, American poetry, because we are reading poetry in France. Mm -hmm. in, we're yeah. reading, you can get in, translated into French so many, like you're reading you know, Austrian poets translated into French, you're reading different poets translated into French. The Quebec government supports translation of international works into French by Quebec translators. So if I could just get going translating into French more, then I could publish my translations easier. But so that there's more of a, they send people out more. They have more cult cultural, a lot of cultural outreach. Um, mm. Send people to festivals and stuff, and they bring us back the news. People come back from the festival, they bring back the news. And because because I translate from French, I get to know like who the American poets are like Cole Swenson, say, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Norma Cole, who translate from French. Right. And so that, and through them, I get to know other poets. So that was kind of my, and so the USA was just a, a country with poets m much like any other country, and I got to know it a bit. But so I think that the situation's a bit different. I'm always kind of surprised when people like are, are just looking in Canada towards the States, because there's a whole world out there, you know? I, I, the States is great, but it's, uh, it's not all the world, so. So there, I think there's a bit difference there. Yeah, that's, that's certainly true, because we have two, you know, two official languages, plus um, a really rapidly, uh, like, expanding and, and uh, exciting indigenous uh, community as well of writers who are reclaiming languages and um, we have a little bit of a different climate I in that regard but I think in English I have noticed that um, I don't know they, there's been a change because I think Canadians are kind of self-effacing like they, I think that cliche about Canadians is sort of true too. Like we kind of are self-effacing and we look elsewhere to see what's good. And then I think that over, you know, over the last while, I don't know how long, but as sort of Canadian voices have gotten stronger and maybe we're finding some footing, the community is also kind of like imploding uh, in terms of interpersonal relationships. <laughs> so it's created a lot of conflict. So I, I don't know, it's like we're, we're, we're still kind of like finding our way in, in a way as, as a nation of, of writers. And uh, I think sometimes we are, yeah, we're just, we tend to continue to look elsewhere. I think for markers sometimes of, of what success is. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if anyone has questions. We have a mic, so just so you, we can record you for our webcast, uh, we'd love to have you uh, um, ask anything you'd like, just wait for the mic to come to you. This is a question for all three of you. I wonder, um, in your process of writing, are you mindful of the spoken word when you write, or are you writing towards more of um, a, a read perspective of your readers? I can answer first, uh, absolutely. I edit by, my final stage of editing, I record my work and then I listen to it. And then I always, I always make changes based on my ear. I think for me, um, it's an oral art. The, the text is a score um, that I, I, I write books, um, but I, I consider it an oral art. Uh, I'm totally with you on that, Aisha. That, uh, I mean, poetry is best, to me it's like a tissue, like you're writing something, you're writing a book, it's not like writing a bestseller, you're contributing to kind of possibilities of thought in language in different ways. I mean, I don't like thinking, I was at your university there where they used to think where there was a big divide between the lyric and experimental. But I, was, I remember telling one of the students in the class who was more of a, felt he was more of a lyric poet. And I, he said to me, like, you're an experimental poet, and, and how can you teach me? And I said, uh, don't you ever experiment? <laughs> and then he said, yes. I'm like, well, come and talk to me about your experiments. Because, I mean, we're all experimenting, but there's, there's different ways to do it. But I, I think like that, that voice really matters, and it also really matters reading poetry 
allowed. You choose things based on who you're reading to, and you you want to. There's there's something there with both the sound of poetry that goes beyond the sense. As I was saying, I want poems not to make sense, but they do make sense because they sound. So it's really critical. Yes, <laughs> sound is incredibly important to me. I my my first book, Broom Broom. It's maybe more obvious because I play a lot with form in that book and I play a lot with rhyme. But what happened was I finished that book and I was kind of spent, I was like wrung out and I didn't know what I was gonna do next and I didn't wanna write the same book again. So I kind of took this fallow period and I was writing prose and book reviews and just kind of fooling around, experimenting. I don't, I find those terms absolutely unhelpful and that's partly why I had to leave that school. <laughs> yeah. But, um, because I totally agree with you, Erin. Uh, and so then to, to that point, I said, okay, now I'm writing a lot of prose, so I'm gonna write prose. I'm gonna write a book of essays. So I sat down to write a book of essays and I like started with the cadaver stuff. I'd always wanted to write about the visible human project, so it seemed like a good, place to start, I guess. And I had this sort of like few pages of just really dense writing, all filling a page and, you know, I would read it and show it to friends and I felt utterly claustrophobic about it and it wasn't working. And then they were like, oh, why don't you just let, let it breathe more? <laughs> like, just put a few sentences on a page. And then, oh, it started to look a lot like poetry. And then I realized, the, the, so, the, so the piece I read tonight, it exists at the level of the sentence. In that regard, I guess you could call it prose, except that my, I cannot stop approaching it as a poet, which means that the next step after giving it space to breathe on the page and, and kind of making it look more like poetry was that I had to think about a way to read it out loud. And I haven't read it out loud very often. Monty heard me read it in Ottawa, and I was really glad to hear that it, it, that it worked for him because reading sentences terrified me. I was like, how do you make sentences sound good? I don't know, like I'm used to writing at the level of the line. I'm used to everything rhyming and having certain rhythm. And uh, so when I was gonna read here tonight, I was so tempted to go back to my book because I'm used to reading that and I, I know how it's going to work for an audience but this book this book won't get done it can't happen unless I can hear it and so I've just been working on that cultivating that so I think that for me right now I didn't know what sentences could sound like or should sound like but as a poet I needed to hear them out loud before it made before they worked for me you have a question back there Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I, don't, I don't have a, a really broad knowledge of uh, Canadian poetry, but I used to work in a bookstore in San Francisco, and the few instances where we would get used books from Canadian writers sort of coming into the shop, I remember them being really, um, I hate to use the word experimental since it seems like it might be slightly <laughs> problematic, but that it, was, that it was really unique and not very easy to to read, not very comprehensible for, for lack of a better term, um, but just you know much different from the other sorts of experimental writing that maybe was going on in San Francisco at the time. Uh, so that sort of became my conception of Canadian poetry for a while based on the two or three books by Canadian writers that I had found. Um, am I way off in that? I mean, I'm sure I am, but how do I put it? Is there, is there a, a strong sense of, of experimentation in Canadian poetry, I don't know, after the Second World War and, and on? Um, I don't know about after the Second World War. I mean, yes, I mean, but there's, I mean, the it's <laughs> really, there's, a, there's everything. Yes. There's mm -hmm. truly mm -hmm. everything. So in the same way that you guys have everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My question. 
questions for Aisha. Am I saying that right? Okay. Aisha. Aisha. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, like, uh, as a black creative, like, do you feel that you're given the same opportunities as your white counterparts? And what's it like to be a black creative in Canada? Artist <laughs> is how I would identify myself. Um, uh, do I feel like I'm given the same opportunities? I mean, I'm, I think your question kind of answers itself. Um, Canada is also a white supremacy. Um, I, I mean, I've been successful. Um, I'm sure, but I, no, I'm not given this, I'm, like I'm, my work is also challenging apparently like, I can't, like, take that out of quotes because I don't, that's not how I see it, but I think that the way that, it's a good question, so I'm like, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, Canada is racist, so that's the answer to your first question. Um, the answer to your second question is, what is it like being a black artist in Toronto? Um, I, okay, so I don't know, like I've only been an adult in Toronto really, though I do make art in Montreal as well. There's a big performance community in Montreal. Um, I want to answer you honestly. And that means that Toronto is a conservative city I find and it is uh, I, I don't know, it's been so good to me, actually. Um, I've, it's been so good to me, and it continues to be really good to me, and I'm really grateful. Um, I get frustrated by how conservative I find it, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I find a lot of things conservative. <laughs> um, and I find that maybe the, 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 what I'm finding difficult to articulate is how like, and, and this is like essentially like racist, is like my, what is expected or understood of me, like if, it's, if it does get accepted that I'm an artist, then the, like it's, it seems to be a problem that I'm challenge, that I challenge. Um, and I, that, I find that really frustrating, but um, I think that is part of the work as an uh, African and as a woman um, to, like I actually like think that, like I think about weirdness, weird is a very important category for me. I understand weirdness as the place where reality exceeds our current understanding of it. We're like, that's true, but that's well, that's weird. Like, so like, so when I'm told that I'm weird or things are weird, I'm like, yeah. Like, to me, the more weird things are, the bigger they make me. The more they expand like reality for me. So, but you know, like I'm also colonized, so I like I want people to like me. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Those are all the things. Those are some of the things. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we do one last question? So go ahead. So first off, um, I'm a thinker. I'm not necessarily a poet in my own mind. I really enjoyed your readings. This is the first time that I've ever been to this type of an event. <clears throat> but going back to my initial comment that I'm a thinker. So. When I think about poetry that I've read in the past and then think about what you all um, spoke of, one question comes to my mind in the comments that you've given is that inspiration of the pieces that you write, do they come from you in an evolved sense? Meaning like you first started off saying that you wrote this long um, paper about the body something like that, but then you whittle it down to a sentence and then let that grow. So I'm kind of wondering, do you find yourselves doing more of an evolved um, piece or does it come by a direction like you have a epiphany and then you start 
thinking about it and then it all comes to you and you get, you're able to write down all the thoughts. How, how does it actually happen for you? I, I'd like to hear from all of you. I have to work really, <coughs> really hard <laughs> because I, I, I'm not, it, <laughs> I don't know, this is, Part of me wants to say like I'm like kind of stupid or like I'm not very smart, so I have to like work really hard because the first thing I think about is not very good. So I have to unless I keep pushing on something, I just end up with like a lot of shit. And so I have only written one book so far, and I'm you know like that was in 2014, and I'm still probably a couple of ways away years away from my second book, and I I just have to keep pushing on things. So my inspiration might be something like, I want to write about what it's like to have insomnia. So that could be like the impetus to start working on something. But from the minute I have the thought I'm going to write a book about insomnia to the when the book comes out, it could be like 10 years. I don't know. <laughs> like it takes a long time. So. Um, it's not an either or. Like I would say, uh, like I work a lot and I also get epiphanies. Um, and uh, so I think that the like the the longer piece that I read um, is from my Tumblr. I actually it's funny that you use the word epiphany because I would record my epiphanies on my Tumblr. Um, so I had this practice of doing them, and and I would, but I would take them you know, cut and paste it, t put them into a file, and then read them, and then cut out the ones, and like, so I still worked on them. So, um, and, and even, I think even, I, I even want to challenge the idea of an epif, like, I mean, of an epiphany, because uh, the epiphanies come as a result of having a practice. Like, the epiphanies have, like, connections get made because you're thinking and you're reading, and I'm reading this book, and then, a problem that I like it gets solved because I'm reading like because I'm working and so I don't I think I, I don't see them as like a, a post um, like you're you're feeding the, the genius you're feeding the spirit that like you, like it, it only rewards you because it gets fed which makes total sense to me I, know, I really like whoops I forgot this thing I really like to when you said like the prob a problem gets solved because I'm reading, because you're also when you're working, you're reading so many other different things, and those things feed you and make some thoughts come. Because uh, otherwise, like for me, my basic thought in the morning is, I want some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it's really lousy for poems, and then then I want breakfast, then I want lunch and dinner. That's why I became a cook, but <laughs> instead of going to creative writing school, because but. Um, but I also like sometimes I'll write. I need to get some language on the page so that there's not nothing there. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm sometimes I'm not very good at that, so I have to get a really small notebook so that you can fill a page real quick. And I use a pencil and I write big. And then I just I'm just happy if I write on the pages for a few days in a row. I just write some of the pages. I don't even look at it because if I look at it, I'll get depressed. And you know that's. Uh, that's no good. So I, but later I go back and look, and then I see, oh, like some things actually. There's a few th little things happening in the language here that that are provoking more thoughts. I'm going to take them out and stick these things together, and or sometimes I just it's so such bad nonsense, and I just decide I'm going to type it because I like writing on paper with a pencil. A pencil is my favorite computer. You know the kind you sharpen. Mm -hmm. It's like, so I I like when the lead gets duller and then it gets thicker and stuff. So it's immensely entertaining to me, that part. <laughs> and then I just type stuff up and read it out loud, and then sometimes I kill myself laughing, and that's it, I throw it out. But So I, I, it takes a long time, kind of. But like both of you, I work. I'm sorry, electronic or manual sharpening? <laughs> <laughs> no, the manual one. Well, manual. thanks to all of our uh, poets coming. <laughs> Thank you.
And of course, thanks to Monty and Denis. And thanks to you for coming out. Uh, books are for sale in the back. I'm sure all of our poets would love to sign copies. Uh, let me remind you again about your surveys. Please fill them out. You can leave them on the chairs or hand them to me. Uh, we do have a sign-up sheet out in the front. If you want to know about more events, uh, we have some great ones coming up. So hope to see you there. Thank you.